Welcome to Connecticut Veterans for Peace. I'm Steve Fournier. We're in West Hartford, Connecticut at West Hartford Public Access Television. I'm with Guy Blay. I'm French too. I use the English pronunciation of my French name too. And um, we're, we're talking about ceasefire today, and, and that's ceasefire applies to what's going on in the Middle East, in Palestine. Or we call, you could say Palestine, Israel. Uh, this is, no, we haven't really agreed yet on on uh, how what we how we want to refer to that uh, part of the world. It's been uh, in flames for almost my whole life. And uh, so, and uh, Guy served um, in. Uh, he's an infantryman, as you can you'll be able to see with his badge. He has the combat infantryman's badge with the. Uh, with the oak leaf cluster around it, and so he's faced uh, enemy fire in Korea. And I'm um, with uh, Jim Brazil, uh, Jim Brasile, I'm going to pronounce his name. Exactly, Italian. Italian, Italian. sure. An Italian. And um, he's from uh, Newington, grew up in uh, New Britain, went into the Marines at the age of uh, 18, I guess, yep. and uh, went to Vietnam with the Marines, and that was a tough assignment. I served with the 69 16th Security Squadron of the United States Air Force from uh, 1966 to 1970, served in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Didn't have to go into the war, although the war was going on at the time. That was one of the things that we questioned. The, you know, what is this mission? What is this mission? I mean, are they serious? You know, are they ever serious? <laughs> you know, yes. it's one of the questions I think that uh, Veterans for Peace answer from time to time, probably in some ways better than uh, civilians do. And so let's, uh, uh, Jim is, is um, the coordinator and uh, leader of our uh, chapter of Veterans for Peace, our Connecticut chapter, chapter 42 of Veterans for Peace, and he's, he's um, a committed activist, something that he discovered uh, that he was. He didn't know that he was Later a on. young fellow, yeah. you know, but uh, uh, he was a, uh, a compliant Marine, as you have to be if you want to be a Marine, and he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, what uh, Chapter 42 has been doing. You know, uh, we're in the, we're, we're really well into a, a resurgence of anti-war activism. And uh, it's because of current events, obviously. But whatever the reason, it's, it's, you, we're calling on veterans. And uh, veterans are calling on each other. And uh, Jim uh, is going to tell you a little bit what, about what, uh, what has been happening with our chapter. So uh, tell us a little bit, Jim, about uh, yeah. what's been happening with our yeah. chapter. Uh, thank you, Steve. And thank you, uh, Blaze, for coming here. Uh, we had a little quick trip up to Windsor in the snow, and we'll have to go back in the snow, but it, so far it's turned out very well. And I want to thank the people that are helping us produce this program, and also Carmen, who's a member of Veterans for Peace, who's behind this. Um, Veterans for Peace is a uh, international organization of veterans and non-veterans. Um, of the veterans, some are combat veterans, some have just been in combat areas like I was in Vietnam, some are peacetime veterans in, in some respects, uh, but most importantly, you don't have to be a veteran to be a member of Veterans for Peace. All you have to do is be aware that there's an alternate wet path other than war and aggression. It's peace and nonviolence to some extent. We're not looking for heaven on earth, but boy, there should be better balance between going to war all the time and most of our lifetimes and, and, and living in peace. Um, so Veterans for Peace is this military organization. Going to national on the internet, it's veteransforpeace.org. If you want to contact Connecticut Veterans for Peace, just send me an email right now. It's vfpconnecticut42 at gmail.com. And I, will get, I don't bombard people with emails. I am on, we are on the internet also. Uh, Facebook, James Lewis Philip 
Brazel, if you want to search for that. Um, so uh, nationally, um, just recently, um, we've ta taken a peaceful stance on Gaza, the bombing of Gaza, the Ukraine situation, which is still going on, which we have forgotten about. It's now on page three as opposed to page one. But Veterans for Peace is for uh, peace and nonviolence, cease fire now in Palestine. Um, I'm going to go through quickly a couple things that um, we did locally this past year. Uh, this is our first um, show this year, so happy uh, new year to everybody. Be safe and healthful, healthy this year. Um, with all this information, right off the bat, I want to remind teachers or students or grandmas and grandfathers, if you can contact a teacher, we are offering a $50 pizza party for anyone that is interested, any teacher that contacts us, we will come in, we'll treat you for pizza, and we'll also give you a little history background at the level of a high school, intermediate, even elementary school. We would be happy to come in and talk to people. We are here to educate people, to make them aware of the information that's out there because a lot of the information, and Guy will tell you about this a little bit more later on, is left out. Uh, this past year at the Civic Center on November, November 11th, about 10 of us showed up at the Yukon basketball game, which is at the Hartford Civic Center, and we had our signs to cease fire now, because at the time, on November 11th, which we call Armistice Day, which most people call Veterans Day, the Israelis had started bombing Gaza, and I think maybe at that time there was 2,000 deaths. Now, if they listened to us, and some of the signs that we had, to call Blumenthal's office, call John Larson's office, call your representatives, we could have saved about 20,000 lives, because now, the death toll is about 22,000, I think, dead in, in Gaza. So that's a shame. Toward the end of the year, we do publicize the Christmas truth, the truce that happened in 1914 uh, when soldiers stopped uh, fighting themselves. And if you want more information on that, we'd be happy to come into a school and tell you about that. Um, in West Hartford, we got together with Jewish Voices for Peace and the Palestinian youths down here. Uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, I think we started. We walked up the street a ways. We were in front of one of the restaurants and we had uh, uh, Hanukkah lighting there. And all these more uh, uh, young people kids than older kids were, uh, older people were there, and it was very nice. It was nonviolent, and we're just trying to, to educate people in peace nonviolence. We also lost three people, and I just want to mention their names. Um, Al Martyr was 101 years old. He was our oldest member. He passed away. Al was very influential in the New Haven Armistice Project, the U.S. Peace Council, the Greater New Haven Peace Council, the New Haven Peace Commission. We also lost Peter Upton. Uh, there was a nice um, service at the Unitarian Church. Uh, he was in the swift boats with um, John Kerry, who showed up, and we got a picture, Guy, myself, and John Kerry. Uh, maybe we can get a picture, uh, maybe they'll put it up here, in which we talked to John, and he mentioned Veterans for Peace. And finally, Herb Hoffman, who Guy Blaze and I visited Blumenthal's office uh, last September, maybe 2022, and we asked him to do something for us. And we are still going to war, so I think he could have done a little bit more. Um, so at this point, we're going to think about these three people. There's another baby that is in, in connected to Veterans for Peace down in Texas. Uh, Ryland that we want to remember. And we also want to remember at this time, in maybe a 30-second moment of silence, are the Palestinians and the Jewish people, especially the innocent ones, 
not only the innocent ones, but the soldiers that are forced to get into a combat situation and do things that are not human, all right? They're following orders that maybe they're in a situation where they cannot do anything else. So with that said, uh, maybe 30 seconds of silence to remember those people. Amen. Breaking the Silence. That actually is the name of a book about um, disaffected Israeli soldiers. Uh, the break, and the silence they're talking about is uh, the, the silence that accompanies service in that particular army, because uh, the, the army, <laughs> you, you hear this uh, from time to time now from some of the experts that you hear speaking about this war, is that uh, this Israeli army, their experience is not in battle. Mm -hmm. Their experience is in uh, ordering civilians around. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. That's what soldiers do in Israel. And, and they don't like it. You know, you wouldn't like it if you had to do that. You know, you think you're there to fight. You, they're not there to fight. They're there to, to browbeat and oppress. Mm -hmm. And they don't like it. I mean, some of them like it, I'm sure. But <laughs> They don't like it, they don't, and, uh, and so the silence has been broken. It's a, it's a book. And, uh, well, breaking the silence. And, and you know, you've been talking about uh, Peled. Uh, you've got mm -hmm. the book, his mm -hmm. book right here uh, today. He is, uh, yeah. I mean, he, not only does he come from uh, military people, his father and grandfather, uh, and founders of that state, which is a, a new state. Israel didn't exist when I was a baby. Hmm. There was no such thing. Yeah, well, and and so yeah. uh, and he is, um, you know, uh, one of the foremost spokesmen for the peace movement in Israel right now, and he's a former soldier himself, so he's a veteran for peace. Yeah, and and just breaking the silence is also what they also call Martin Luther King's most, we think, as veterans, uh, most influential speech, which is never mentioned in a school, and we will, you know, contact those uh, teachers if they want a little lesson on the speech that Martin Luther King gave in 1967, Breaking the Silence, or Breaking the Silence, also known as uh, the peace, uh, no, not the peace speech. Um, we will come in and, and, and do that for them. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, speaking of what's not said, a guy <coughs> had a piece in that the current was, um, they, they, somebody must have made a mistake because they published oh, it. Oh, they did. Yeah, I didn't did they know publish that. that? They published your letter, didn't they? Uh, not the one you're talking about. No, okay. Well, there, there was a letter that Guy circulated to the members, to the chapter. Yes. And I, we don't know if it's ever going to be published, but... but I, I think the current sense is all anti-war letters. You think they do, yeah. Yes. I think they do, too. And this, now, this was more than just an anti-war letter. This was um, an anti-media letter, because the media is responsible for this vast pool of ignorance that Americans seem to live in. You know, it just is, um, no one seems to know uh, the history of this, of, of the various conflicts that we're funding and, and participating in. And you had something to say about that. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about uh, that uh, offer that you made? Well, I, I like to tell my friends that I have a degree in propaganda. <laughs> Actually, it was called Advertising Design at Rhode Island School of Design. And throughout the world, all countries, the people, regular people don't want war. But it takes propaganda to pave the way to all wars. Everything we read in the media, corporate media, that has to do about war, is all lies and propaganda. No exception. Everything is propaganda in the way it's presented. Uh, every war it can, it has to be paved with propaganda. In the Vietnam War, for example, it was the Gulf of Tonkin propaganda. Well, they told us that 
if Vietnam fell, that that was going to be, uh, there, it was going to be like dominoes falling over, that that was going to lead to another country falling and another country falling, yes. and eventually the entire world would be overtaken by the evil. And it wasn't evil, of course. It was just people wanting to, to govern their own country, for God's sakes. But uh, that was an evil, as far as, as we were told. And uh, we believed it for a little while. But the Gulf of Tonkin lies uh, was also about the supposed attack with torpedoes and everything on two, two American destroyers who were according to the propaganda in international waters. And at that time, because of the pro-war media, 88% of the people were in favor of going to war in Vietnam. Only two senators voted against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution to send troops to Vietnam. That was Senator Morse from Oregon and Senator Gruning from Alaska. And to show you the, the power of, of propaganda, both of these senators who were popular, uh, because they were media demonized them because of their anti-war position, uh, they lost their next election. And well, that was because money was withdrawn from their, I mean, the, the, in today's uh, politics, it's almost not politics, it's almost like it's an election industry that's uh, for the purpose of raising money. And that seems to be what these men and women do yeah, most of the time, is try to get money. And you know, they don't get, them, they don't get the money from people that don't have it, which would be most of us. They get the money from people that do have it. And that's a funny thing, because those people, they have an agenda, is to get more money. And for some reason, we're okay with that, I guess. It's not bribery, but looks like bribery. Quacks like a duck, you know, but it's not a duck. Well, like the actual facts were wrong. And, uh, but it doesn't matter, because you know, the, the purpose is to go to war. Why do you suppose that? Why, why do you think the uh, media are so enthusiastic about war? Is it because it, it sells to their audience? Is that the reason? Just well, to well, while most people are against war, the, we always have war because there are a small percentage of people who profit from war. And they have the powers, like all the politicians. Suppose they had to face what you faced in Korea. You, you know, um, Guy is, uh, he's a lot older than he looks, you know. Uh, Korea, that's, we're talking about uh, something that happened, uh, you know, a 19, long time ago. Yeah, 1950. 50, 51. Yeah, so that's when he was like 20 years old and uh, 18 you were when you went, right? Well, when I went in the service, I was 17. 17. For three years, then I was extended. Yeah. If everybody had to face what you faced, do you think that that would change the uh, public opinion? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is, um, you, you uh, when did you discover that you were opposed to war? How long did it take you in Korea to discover that? Well, when I joined the military at 17, I knew nothing about foreign affairs. You know, was, like the rest of us, right. And I'd like to relate maybe to, to my last uh, experience in combat uh, was actually when I came back home. Is that <coughs> within a week that I left my platoon, infantry, infantry platoon, where I was a first scout in a, in a rifle squad, my platoon was overhand by the Chinese, and everybody was killed. And uh, so every day of my life, I've thought about the people I knew that was killed and the stupidity of the whole thing. And Imagine if you had to explain to their, to their parents and their brothers and sisters, uh, you know, why uh, you didn't. I mean, maybe some, you may have had to do that at well, some point, but... Uh, uh, well, you, you, I think Korea was bad. Is it? Biden doesn't have to explain. Yeah. 
Nobody makes him explain. The politician and the general sent the troops into North Korea without winter closing. And I spent the whole winter in the field, and a lot of soldiers, thousands, died of frostbite. And being from Vermont, I knew what below zero weather was. And I still have a problem with you never get over frostbite. I think, and, uh, I think you said the Chinese were more supplied, better supplied than the Americans. Well, it's interesting. The Chinese soldiers were actually better armed than we were for night fighting because they had guns that could hold you know, 50, 60 round clips. If they could drive them there, they didn't have to ship them over the ocean. You know, they weren't thousands of miles away. They were on the border, as a matter of fact. But if you, if you can imagine, like... They want to go at them again, too. They know they want to fight the Chinese again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you can imagine spending, like today, we're having a, a little bit of snow and a little, little bit of icing. But can you imagine spending the whole winter out in a place that's colder than Connecticut? Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, there wasn't a lot of sympathy for you either because, th I don't know what people thought was going on over there, but they didn't think that um, you were freezing to death. Well, like all wars, nobody knows the, the background, the history of it. Or, you know, it's like in, Viet in Vietnam, you had the Gulf of Tonkin. In the two Iraq war, the propaganda, one of the wars, was weapon of mass destruction. And Saddam Hussein, or to uh, get rid of the sanction that the US and the UN had applied to his people, that killed 500 children. Mm -hmm. To get rid of the sanction, he had to promise to get rid of all his weapon of mass destruction. And he didn't have any. When, when people hear sanctions, I just want to tell them, when they say the United States is sanctioning a country, it, the problem is they're putting pressure on the civ civilians in that country, and they're, they're destroying the economy of that country. Well, the UN made a big study of, of the effect it had on children, and they were very careful with the finding because they, they knew they would be criticized by the finding. And the finding was that American-led UN sanctions against Iraq killed 500,000 children aged five and under. And uh, the survey went to every hospital in the country and reviewed records before and after the war. And they could see how cutting out penicillin in all medicines to which were sanctioned was devastating to newborn. Mm -hmm. And so there's nobody that kills people like the U.S. military because we have the most powerful military in the world. Maybe even to the point, uh, you know, the weapons are so lethal and so destructive that you wonder whether anyone can ever wage war successfully Again, for conquest, forget about it. The United States, law, we have the most powerful military, the most well-funded military in history, and we lost a war to Afghans in sandals, to um, Arabs, to, uh, to everybody that we've challenged. And, and uh, you know, and why can't we win a war? Because, because it, it, it's obsolete. And I know you know how much the budget is of the Pentagon every year. It's it's like more than the, the next ten countries combined. Right, and it, close to a trillion dollars. Yeah, here. yeah, eight hundred uh, billion. Each of course, year. Yeah, those numbers they mean so little because they're so big, they're astronomical. But um, it's kind of funny that you can't win one, and so why the hell do you want to do it? So well, that somebody <laughs> gets money from it. Somebody gets profits from it. Yeah. So the second war in Iraq, again, it has to be paid with propaganda. And the propaganda was about the killing of 300 babies in the Kuwaiti hospital by the Iraqi soldiers. Again, that was a complete lie. Totally made up. 
And the Kuwait government, they hired a PR agency from Washington to create a story that would change people's opinion about going to war because the majority of people were against going to war at that time with Iraq. So this pub public relations agency in Washington, uh, they had these hearings with three people from supposedly from from Iraq that were victimized by Saddam Hussein. And the whole thing was televised nationally. And even uh, it was made so believable that even it fooled Amnesty International. And the president reprinted a book that Amnesty, Amnesty International had produced and sent it to all colleges in, in, in the US. And the, uh, so the first person who, who met was this beautiful looking young girl. She claimed that she was a, a nurse at this hospital and that she had seen the soldiers pull the babies out of the incubator and throw them on the floor and kill them. She, she saw that they had, according to her, they killed 300 children. And she had crying and, and, uh, and the hearings were all held. There was about five uh, pro-war Congress people. And the hearings were not in, in the Capitol buildings, in the government building. They were in the PR company's building because in that situation the witness could lie whereas if you're lying in Congress you get in trouble for lying so 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 the next day you know and this received coverage televised coverage top story in all the newspapers in the country so next witness next witness comes up is this big lady she claimed that she had seen she claimed that she had uh, seen this stuff and she had five she had had queen tuplet like like the day before the uh, this baby killing baby killing is a very popular thing to do they're doing them now. They're, they're talking about yeah, it again. Well, yeah, they're doing well, that did, again. Did the baby kill lies to justify the attack on Gaza? So, so this big lady gets on the national TV again, and, and a lot of reporters, complete coverage, and uh, she said that, that she had returned after giving birth. She'd gone home return the next day and all, all her five children had been killed you know and she was crying and, and so that was the second day to witness again national national television hours the next day or the third so-called witness was someone who claimed he was a doctor there that he had seen personally the burial of all these children. And again, massive news coverage. And so what, what, what all these lies and propaganda showed is that how it changes people's attitude towards war. Because now baby killing is the no-no and the uh, uh, lost my thoughts on it. The, the people who were against the war were a majority before these hearings. After the war, people's opinion were changed where they were against the war before. Now the majority of people, by a small percentage, they favored the war. 
Yeah, there were flying flags in some guy, places. Weren't some of these? They were phony. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, we're talking about the ones that are phony. Yeah, the one that the one that claimed that she saw the babies thrown on the floor turned out to be the daughter of a diplomat from Kuwait. Yes, yes. Uh, she was not a, a nurse at all. She was not anything like she said she was. She was a an actress, basically. That's what she was. Yeah. And I think all of them were uh, phonies, weren't they? Yes. All, yeah, all the stories were phony, three, right? Yeah, there were three coach witnesses. They're, they're all good actors. And, and we're coming they, into the home stretch, by the way, uh, for this. And um, But they were actors. Okay, well, thanks, Jim. And thanks, Guy. And I um, hope that we've uh, enlightened our audience and uh, brought them some comfort because we may be uh, in the middle of um, a resurgence of anti-war sentiment and maybe we're going to have peace at some point in the near future after all. Thanks from uh, Veterans for Peace. <laughs>